Okay, everybody, thank you for coming. Um, sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, we opened the meeting at 6.02. I uh, made a motion to go into executive session for the employment history of a certain individual. Uh, we came out at 7.08, and here we are. So thank you for coming and apologize again for uh, keeping you waiting. Uh, first thing that we're gonna talk about, um, and I'll just give a quick little summation. Um, at our last meeting, we, uh, January 20th, we had a presentation by Ann Dinio, our business official, on the um, veterans ex alternative veterans exemption pursuant to Section 458A of the property tax law. Uh, that's on our uh, school website under board docs where you can actually access all our um, uh, materials, all our documents, agendas, backups, and now videos as well of all our meetings. Um, at that meeting, uh, there was a general consensus that we want to move forward with this, so we scheduled a public hearing, which was advertised in both papers, uh, also on the website. Uh, and I wrote a letter to the PCNR, and I submitted one actually to Dot Info as well, um, just asking for people's feedback. Uh, so that's kind of where we are today. Um, I'm hoping that you know we hear from some of you if you like. Uh, and that's basically what we're here for now. Uh, our plan is to, and we'll talk about this after we hear some comments, uh, to put this on our agenda for February 24th, which is our next meeting, uh, and have a resolution uh, which the board will vote on, um, either for or against. And I'll stick my neck out and say I'm in favor of it, so there's one vote right there. Um, but that's kind of what our plan is. So tonight's really just to hear people and any opinions that they have in any regard to the topic. Uh, prior to that, Anne, if you could just do a quick summation of kind of some of the information for anyone who um, didn't look up the information or wasn't here at the last meeting. And then we'll open the public hearing and anyone who would like to speak, um, all we ask is that you just um, give us your name uh, and keep it to three to five minutes. somewhere in the middle of the presentation that I gave last week. Last week I um, explained more of um, what the different levels of exemptions are and I was asked tonight to share the slides that um, showed the financial impact. Um, this shows the amount, um, the first box is, the top box is the amounts for the town the current town level of exemptions and the lower box is the basic maximum level and um, it shows what portion of an assessment would be exempt um, depending on which level that we went with this slide takes the information from the first one and brings it in here and compiles it in a different fashion it shows the tax levy shift um, because the veteran's exemption is not reimbursed by the state like the STAR exemption is, um, the approval of this exemption will result in a tax shift f from one group of taxpayers to another group. Um, at the 1415 tax rate for the Haldane District right now, if the board went with the um, maximum level that the town right now is giving, uh, just over 240 or just under $246,000 of um, tax levy would be shift to um, non-veterans. Uh, the basic maximum exempt amount that we're discussing tonight um, is 54,653 would be the amount shifted um, to the, the non-veteran taxpayers. Um, this just shows what the different tax rates would be and the increases um, 
in a, in a better fashion is this slide that shows the dollar amount that everybody um, would really want to zero in on that um, for the basic maximum level, the veterans will see a savings of $192 on their tax bill if they're eligible for the wartime exemption. The combat, it's a cumulative exemption, so you're, you would get the wartime and the combat level. That would result in a savings of $320, and a disabled veteran is a, a separate exemption that um, is not cumulative with the wartime and the combat, and that's an, an additional $639. Um, for the non-veteran, that um, shift that I talked about earlier, we would see uh, about $21 based on this year's tax rate, uh, an increase in their taxes of $21. And that's based on a hypothetical home with an assessed value of $200,000. Um, I did a little more research. Um, President Curto asked, you know, is that a good representation of the the homes? And um, yes, it is that the single family residential homes, two hundred thousand, is really the average taxable assessed value of Phillips Town. Um, the other item that is up for discussion is whether or not the board wants to adopt a resolution to include a gold star parent. Um, that would be a separate resolution. And um, that's all that I, that I have to say on it, unless you have any questions. Okay. Thank you, Ann. Uh, and the gold star parents, if I understand it correctly, um, Adding that to the other three categories uh, doesn't require a public hearing. It's just done through a resolution. That's correct. Okay, so in other words, if we get to the point where we're going to do a resolution, which I think we are, uh, for the first three, we can just add that fourth piece um, prior to when we're going to vote on the meeting. On right, the and the Gold Star parents would be eligible for the wartime and the combat zone exemption um, only. Obviously, they, they wouldn't be able to get the, the disabled one, but um, they would be eligible for the same level of exemption. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Can you review the cost? Okay. Go, can you go back to one slide? The, uh, the, 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 um, the cost now, the, what would, the, the, the tax implication cost. To the taxpayer? Yeah. For Gold Star? No, for... for Dollars, that per household? Oh no, for the for the, right for the for the gold star. Do you have an answer for that or? No? It would, if it, it would be granted at the same level. Right. right now, there are no applications for gold star parents. Oh. So unless someone that has not applied already applies, um, I have no so no way to, to know that. Either, it would yeah, be minimal because right now there is zero that have applied. But we would need a second hearing. To, we would have to even do it. Uh, the Gold Star Parent option is an add-on resolution um, that the board can can decide to, to okay. add. You don't need a separate hearing for that. You'd oh. need a separate hearing if you wanted to grant a different level than the basic maximum. Got it. Okay. Got it. Can we do the hearing at the same time of the resolution? Like if we, so we, so tonight we have to decide if we're going to go above basic and then have another hearing. We're just doing I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, right. No, we're just doing, tonight we're doing the hearing. Right. If in fact we want to either go above or below basic, right. you need a second hearing. After the resolution. After yes. the resolution, correct? Or Yes, here's, here is the, um, the procedures. Maybe I should have gone over this one, too. Um, the board has to hold a public hearing, um, which we're doing tonight, adopting the rev then adopt a resolution approving the basic maximum level that's being discussed tonight. You can adopt the resolution to include a Gold Star parent. And if the board wishes to increase or reduce the maximum level, which is the starting point, you have to hold a separate and distinct public hearing to change the level. So your starting point is the basic maximum that's being discussed tonight, and the resolution will be put before the board next week. 
if you do decide that you want a different level that would have to be a separate hearing and a separate resolution um, time doesn't allow that for the 15 16 tax levy because the deadline is March 1st um, okay and this can be obviously uh, raised and brought up annually yes that's right. so correct it's not something that happens and just it runs forever it could actually be brought up it could be increased it could be in decreased depending on what the world brings right. per se yes that's okay. correct and i'm sorry the um when you say time doesn't allow that's based on our meeting schedule unless we were wanted in you say we wouldn't be well, if we if we, if we change right. if we change allow. the timeline if it you could if allow. you change the timeline and yeah, added meetings, sure. As long as you have the five days notice to the public, you can have another hearing. But um, right, right now, the schedule that we're following, it would not allow. I'm sorry, I wasn't clear on that. Yeah, okay. okay. Any other clarifications? Okay, so uh, from the public, anybody wants to comment? If you could just give, uh, if you want to come up, just give your name, uh, three to five minutes. My name is David Marion. I'm a resident in the district. I'm a, a Vietnam War veteran, uh, two tours of duty. I have a 30% disability, severe loss of hearing, and ringing in my ears. And the reason I came tonight was because I did a lot of research relative to the presentation that was done. I went to the tax assessor's office. I got the current tax rolls which is 1,375 pages. I went through every single one, pulled out all the data as it relates to this district alone, because there's four districts that are listed in the town of Phillipstown. And the, the numbers of wartime veterans is actually nine less. The, the combat uh, veterans are actually 16 more than what, what's in there. And the, the total exemptions, which was listed on the one article, is actually 189. The reason is because 15 dis disabled veterans are also combat veterans. So it, you don't get, it doesn't take away from the overall number of total um, people that pay taxes in the, in the district. The total number of people that pay taxes in the district are 2,721. It actually ends up leaving you 2,532 after you take out the veterans. The division that was done that displays the, the actual impact used the full 2,721. So that number ends up being, the product of that number ends up being wrong because it included the veterans. In the, in the end of the day. Overall, it, when I finished doing the numbers, the, the maximum, the larger uh, adjustment that was looked at is actually less. It ends up being $84 for non-veterans opposed to 95 that was displayed. And the uh, the maximum basic ends up being pretty close to the same. It's about $20. And that, that's a yearly impact number. Um, what I did, rather than use the hypothetical, is I took all of the veterans, because they're the ones that are, are, would generate the impact if, you know, if this was passed. And I took all of their homes, I took all of the full value, I assessed them at 46.35, checked them against the tax rolls, and for the wartime veterans, it's actually 329,299, ends up being 152,630. And for the combat veterans, it's 321,392, ends up being 148,965, and the disabled vets, ends up being 148,985. The other part of the, the uh, display or the presentation, when you, when you work through the numbers, all 15 veterans on the presentation are indicated at 100% disabled, and that's not a fact. I and mean, there's one person 
in the whole district that's 100% disabled. There are several that are 10% disabled. The overall average is 39%. So that's how the number got reduced from 95 to 84 was as a result of the actual tax values for the veterans home and also the disabled rate. Thank you. Can Dave? <laughs> Took about six hours. I actually sent emails to everybody with the attachment. I don't know if you guys got a chance to open it. I, I, I didn't get one. A couple of copies, if you want to look at it. Yeah, I didn't get I one. Didn't Where'd you send it to? Why don't you write down the right email? The, the email. Well, I was going to. I gonna took it off right off the website. It is. Huh. Yeah, it you took the it. Yeah, I didn't get one. Education email. So all that information all you that information. sent us that I just told you about is in here. Okay, because I was going to ask you to do me a favor and if you could yeah. jot it down. <laughs> no, you can have it. Right. I think there's a couple of copies there. Okay. And there's a couple but if you could do me a favor. Sure. So this is what you emailed. Okay. Okay. And was there anything in the in the text of it that we should know about? I mean, the, the first part of it, the, in the, the text of the email just basically refers to the attachment. Okay. Okay, got it. Okay, because I was going to ask you if you could resend it, but you've got everything here. But if you want to resend it, you can. Okay. Just, and I'll give you, before you leave, just my address. I didn't get it. And I check it, unfortunately, more than okay. I should. I'll send it again. Yeah, if you could, but thank you. Okay, anyone else? Sure. And then if you could just give us your name as well. Bill Shapsel. <coughs> I have a friend who passed away about five years ago. He's a veteran of World War II. He lost a lot of action. And the church the other day, his wife asked me, do I get any credit for that? Yes, the um, the veterans exemption does um, allow for a surviving spouse to be covered by this um, if the the particular um, war that we're talking about is listed you know in the the eligibility but surviving spouses are eligible there are several within the actual okay. thank you and that's within the law right that's not necessarily us saying that's not for, let's help right, them that's, out that's, that's not within the we're doing it that's in the law okay good anyone sure um, and then just give your name yeah Louis Weber assuming uh, that the board passes this resolution what um, well, I'm, I'm not the assessor, but what I was told was that you don't have to do anything. I would suggest that you go to the websites that, that is listed earlier in the presentation, and that will give you all of the details for eligibility. And if you have any question, then you really should call the assessor. Let me just clarify that that's if they already receive some kind of exemption. If you would already receive it, you don't have to do anything. If you don't receive any, then you do have to go to the assessor's office. And if you don't receive anything, then you would obviously sign up for the school and the town, correct? And it happens automatically if it's one application? It's just the one. Just the just one. one. Once you do the town, that's what the assessor's office it automatically runs with it. Once it's approved okay. by the district. You have to do it before March 1st. Right. If it ends up passing for the school. Right. Okay. Roger Campbell. Uh, question. 
Would it be okay if you came forward to the microphone? This is just for the benefit of the people watching on, on TV so that they can hear the question and not just the answer. Thanks a lot. I've been in the town about 30 years, and uh, I do have a uh, veteran's, I guess, uh, exemption for the town tax. Uh, since that time, I've had further dealings with the VA, had more disability and all that. I don't think that's ever been recorded. I, at least I haven't gone down. So what do I need to do to, to get that on the tax rolls? You can go to the assessor's office. Okay. And, um, probably fill out another application. Um, the we use the assessment that's given to us from the assessor's office. The school district itself does not um, change assessments or grant exemptions. Those are um, done for us when our tax bills are prepared by the county. So what do I need to do? You, uh, this gentleman said before March 1st. Uh, so, so what do I need to bring down? My DD-214 and any other documentation from the VA that shows I've been increased in disability and that kind of stuff? Um, I, I don't know the particular forms that you're talking about, but I, I think that if you called the assessor's office, they would tell you exactly what you need to bring. Okay. Thank okay. you. All right. Yeah, I would just call them tomorrow and just explain the situation, and I'm sure they can direct you as to what you do or don't need. I, I would assume it's not that complicated of a process. Okay. Anyone else? Dan Dillon. I'm a resident of Cold Spring. I've been a, a graduated from Haldane. <clears throat> I'm also a Vietnam vet. And personally, I would like to see the uh, board approve the uh, Vietnam uh, veterans exemption. I know this may be hard to do, but I wouldn't look at it as a dollar figure. I would look at it as a thank you or recognition for the many veterans in our school district who proudly served our country, and which allows us to have the freedom that we have today. Thank you. And I would agree with you wholeheartedly, Dan. Unfortunately, we also have to just give the information for everybody so that, but I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, Michael Jindulis, veteran, um, United States Air Force currently still. Uh, first of all, thank you to the board for bringing this up. Uh, I was hoping we'd make it last year, but I know with the time crunch by the state, we couldn't do it. I'm glad they're bringing it up this year. Um, to fellow veterans, really, it's your two D, it is your DD-214. You're bringing it to the assessor's office. The school will have nothing to do with it, really, at all. Any other documentation that you can bring to them, if you're trying to get the combat, you've got to show certain ribbons and stuff like that. Um, I'm probably the youngest in the room, not to brag, but, you know. So if you want to bring anything that, sh your DD-214 doesn't list, your, if it doesn't list your medals where you were and stuff like that, other if it shows it, they're going to use that as your combat one. Um, so that's really all you need for probably any VA information they're probably going to want for your, uh, for your disabilities, though, because I don't get disability. I just get the combat and the other one. I get combat and wartime. And if the school does it, it will automatically show up on your school tax bill. You'll see the exemption right there because it's, you already get it from the, from the, from the assessor's office, it automatically shipped over. Well, supposed to be, but it won't be the school's fault, it'd be the assessor's office's fault. So um, I'm all, obviously all in favor for it, and like, like Mr. Dillon said, I, you know, it, it is a thank you to all the veterans that are out there. Thank you, and thank you guys for serving. Thanks for the hard work. Thanks, Mike. Sure. My name is uh, Francis Lay, 24 Mountain Avenue. I've been a combat veteran for 64 years and also a taxpayer to this district for 64 years. And I think this is a long time coming and I'd like to encourage the board to approve it. It's, uh, uh, you know, as a member of, of the village of Cold Spring for all this time, and like Danny, I know him since he was a young boy. I think it might not help me that much longer, but it would help a lot of these younger veterans coming and wanting to live here and have their children go to school here. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Anyone else? And just that point of reference, the law, I believe, was changed last year by Governor Cuomo. So it's been eligible for village towns and other municipalities uh, and just started to be eligible for schools. And I think last year when it came out, it was kind of thrown in uh, relatively quickly as districts were doing school budgets. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of the districts didn't act on it last year. Uh, but most of them, of what I've read, are acting on it this year. And there are some that obviously aren't um, for whatever reasons. So this is relatively a new law. I believe it was Harry Gibson, Okay. Yeah, it was approved, I think, on December 16th, which is the date I read on it. Right. Of, uh, 13, I believe. 13. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I just used the governor as. <laughs> right, but Gibson can get his credit too. Anyone else? Sure. My name is Joseph Ramos. I'm uh, fairly new to uh, Cold Springs, five years now. I'm an Army Infantry vet. <clears throat> I just want to go to the uh, Gold Parent, uh, Gold Star Parents. I think that should be also passed, recognizing, you know, somehow the vets that otherwise won't be recognized through the uh, parents uh, of those guys. So I would say try to pass that also. Okay, Great. thanks. Thank you. Welcome to the community. <laughs> Anyone else? No? Okay. Um, you can also spread the word. If anybody else wants to comment, they can do so in writing. And I was going to uh, leave that process open through uh, February 20th. So if anyone wants to tell a neighbor or friend, uh, that they want to send something to us, they can just put it in writing. Uh, they can address it to either myself, uh, Joe Curto Jr., or the district clerk, um, either by email or uh, just dropping it in the mail at the Craig side. Uh, so through uh, February 20th. Um, and we'll obviously take all that in and uh, in consideration. Um, so I, I think, I, I don't know if it's a motion or, um, if we can maybe make a motion to maybe up the uh, resolution to um, to do it earlier. I don't know if there's a minimum you have to do it, if you can do it at, at this meeting or do it. In other words, it sounds like we can't get to the um, above the basic under our time frame. So sure. I don't know. No, you can actually do anything you want. If, if we want to maybe, you know, uh, if we could do a resolution tonight or do a resolution next week, then we have to do another then a five day public hearing to go above that. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm jumping the gun, but I think if we're going to go through this and, and, and all, all these motions that I think everyone was under the um, idea that we were going to go be able to go above the basic. I'm not saying we're going to go to the max, but definitely above to, if we go above the basic, we have to do a second hearing. So under our time schedule, we cannot go above the basic. So right. well, we may want to consider doing the resolution, having a, having a discussion tonight, doing a resolution tonight, um, having maybe just a, a meeting, uh, you know, uh, an, add an extra meeting um, so we can meet the five-day. Well, the first know. question we should probably just clear up, and it's mostly procedural, is does the board in fact want to go ahead and approve something. So you have two choices. You either do yes or no. Right. So let's get past that one first. Okay. So once we get past that, obviously, then the next conversation. So I'm all in favor of approving it along with the Gold Star parent. Yeah, and I'm happy with the timeline that we've, that we've laid out for, for doing that. Okay. <coughs> yeah. Okay, so we're all in favor of doing it. So it's not an issue of whether it happens or not. Uh, the next question really is, what is the level? Um, the basic level, which is the basic maximum as it's called, um, as far as I'm concerned, I think is, you know, I'm in favor of it, and I'm in favor of an add-on resolution of the Gold Star parent. 
Uh, that seems to be what almost all the districts have approved of what I've seen um, of the ones who have approved it. Well, I was hesitant to comment about, about my feelings at all before the public hearing. Um, so I, I would reserve the same opinion. So if we pass the basic, I'd be reserved to, to really, I'd like to get feedback from the public about, okay, so we got feedback from the public as far as clearly the public that came is for the resolution. So now I'd like to hear feedback, give the public a second chance to come back and if there's to hear um, comments about should we go above the basic. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know if you, you, we haven't heard any anyone against the uh, um, resolution here at, at this hearing. So, um, you know, I don't think it's fair to have a public hearing to make a comment before a public hearing. So I, I think we should pass the basic as fast as possible and have the resolution for another, a second public hearing. Because honestly, I, I don't think we should hide behind a timeline um, as far as not going to the maximum, Joe. No, um, I don't think anybody to, is, to be honest. No, but uh, well, under, under the timeline we have, we cannot pass the basic. We can't go above the basic, right, Ann? Under the timeline we have, timeline we can't go. We have, can't go above the basic. You cannot go so above the basic. So I think that's kind of lost here. So at the end of the day, in March, people are going to say, "Wait a minute, it's only the basic. Why didn't we go maximum?" Well, we didn't have time, but it wasn't. Last year was the state's fault. They didn't give us any notice. They gave us no information. We we couldn't pass it last year because we had no information. But now we have information. So if we don't pass the maximum, it's because we we didn't set a timeline that was giving us enough time to pass it. So, you know what I'm saying? So I think we should, we should try to have a timeline to have a second public hearing. And if we decide not to go to the maximum, then we should decide not to go to the maximum. Can I, can I make a quick suggestion? There's 13 levels between the basic maximum and the maximum. Yes, right. Yeah. I, I think if you're going to put that out in the public, I think give them three options. Well, we said at the last meeting, we said basic, halfway maximum yeah. that would be the three options so we did say that but, but yeah I agree well we said basic maximum and no exemption those were the three options is that what we said that's what we said so obviously the no is out right if I'm hearing everybody correctly no basic maximum. right well, if we want to do for the public, if now that we passed the basic, now we can say, now we're trying to decide if we want to give, stay at the basic, go to X whatever level it was, and or max. Well, we, now, didn't, we didn't pass it yet. If it to, passes. We have to do the resolution. I mean, can we do the resolution on the same night that we do the hearing? Yeah, yeah you okay. can. Okay. Sure. All right. So basically what you can do, if I understand it correctly, is if you want you can have a second public hearing on the 24th you do the public hearing first then you can act on the resolution and the resolution could either be resolution one or resolution two assuming you stick to what we originally spoke of i think if you get into the many different levels that mr marion mentioned it's going to get very confusing and very convoluted um, you know, the other thing that I think you don't want to get into, which I have heard some feedback on, is rather than do it by a board resolution, you do it through a public referendum and let the public decide. I personally don't agree with that because I think that would be extremely divisive and I just don't think you'll get an outcome that you want in that format uh, because people can do anything they want behind the curtain. So, we could do that, do another public hearing, and then just act on those two resolutions or a resolution after the second public hearing, which stays within our timeline. And it's fairly simple. Or we can do a public hearing the week before if we wanted to squeak in just a public hearing, just no board meeting, just a public all hearing. The same night. I mean, yeah. You know what I'm saying? If we, if we None just of do this a is a surprise. I know, but if you want to I don't know what you're waiting for, but basically, you know, we've run ads, we've spoken about it, we've written letters. Well, we have to do it. That's right, not I a surprise. I mean, I think so we I know, know what's going to, how the result will play out, but we need to do it. on top of another date. Let's so just I'm just sort of saying, 24th. if we just do a public hearing, you know. So let's just do it on the 24th. Okay. 
That's fine. Do we, uh, if we decide that we are going to do that on the 24th, and do we have to actually pass the basic max resolution before you can pass the higher or lower resolution? Yes, you you must adopt the resolution to pass to adopt the basic max first, and then a separate, distinct public hearing for the anything other than the basic max. And another resolution. So we, should prob so we should do the basic, or we should, I, I assume that it would pass, obviously, what everyone just said, do that tonight before the next public hearing. If that w if is what the board wishes. I, I'm unprepared with the resolution, but I could do that um, before it's time to adopt that, if you'd like to do that. Okay. okay. Here's my suggestion. To keep it procedurally correct, okay. keep within what we've already agreed on. Uh, let's have our resolution on the 24th uh, for the basic maximum, which is what today's public hearing was on. Uh, we will vote for it or against it. Uh, then we'll have a public hearing on potentially increasing it to the max. Um, and then we'll act on that either yay or nay, and then everything's done on the 24th. We'll publicize the second public hearing in the paper, like we did for the first one. Uh, I'm happy to write another letter reiterating that, and we'll take it from there. How's that sound? Okay. Sound fair, orderly? Any other comments before we close the so-called public hearing? Is the information you presented about the basic max correct? So the impact from taxpayers is $21. That's the basic the max. What is the, is the max? So we're doing the resolution tonight? Is that what you just said? <laughs> when are we doing it? Before the public hearing. That's the town, that's the town one. The yeah. Joe, that's on the How, can we announce a public, I'm sorry. <coughs> Can we announce a public hearing for the second option before we pass the resolution for the first option? I, I, that's what I was going to look into. I don't know. I, I know that procedurally. That's, that was my point, Joe. That's why, I, that's why the timeline wasn't working. I don't know that for a fact. So why don't we just do a, a meeting? Like, why don't we do just a quick, a small meeting? All right, let's do this Just to, to pass make this the resolution simple and not overly complicate this. Well, I'm not trying to complicate it, but under the timeline we have, it's not you're not going to be able to pass the maximum. So I'm trying to make it so you can pass the maximum. No, I'm just trying to follow what we all agree. Yes, yeah, but, but the, I, I'm sorry. Why don't I'm, we do this? Let's do a resolution based on what we posted on our website, and we'll either approve it or not approve it for the basic max today. We'll do it before the end of the meeting. We've all seen it. We've all read it. We've all digested it. It's not anything new. Uh, it's a slight tweak to the system. Uh, but it gets done what we ultimately want to get done. How's that sound? Well, it's a departure from what I think we'd agreed on. And we're not it ready. We don't have the language for the the resolution ready this evening, I don't think. I do not. <coughs> you do it not. Was not. Yeah. It was not on the agenda. Um, I was good with the timeline and the approach that we had outlined previously. Uh, you know, we're having a hearing this evening on the strategy that I think we had proposed going forward, which is also in line with what our uh, neighbors are doing. So. This is. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I mean, we. <laughs> This is getting complicated. This, when you say we agreed on this, I, we, we, we had a, at the meeting two weeks ago, we, we, we were given this presentation. We went through it, okay? And we said we have to pass the basic, then we have to have a public hearing, uh, the resolution, then we have to have five days for another public hearing, okay, to do the maximum. That's what we said, okay? But now, we never, we, but now when we look at it, we, did anyone realize that we weren't going to pass the max, be able to pass the maximum under that schedule? I mean, we're not going to be able to pass the maximum under the schedule. So I'm just, everyone, everyone realizes that. Yeah. Correct. Okay. I mean, 
Okay. John, what would you like to do? Why don't we? I'm flexible either way. Do we? I mean, do you want to just get together? Whenever Ann has the resolution ready, we'll approve it. You can have the hearing on the 24th, and if I don't know, if you need a few five days to do that. Okay, so let's do that. So you want to create a special meeting? We'll create a special meeting next Tuesday. We need three of the four of us. Uh, on the agenda will be the resolution for the basic maximum, which is basically the language that's, for the most part, on our website. And we'll either approve it or we won't approve it. And at the same time, we, we will approve or not approve the public hearing on the 24th, which we have plenty of time to post as a process. How's that sound? Next Tuesday, yes. The following week's the vacation. How's that sound? Is our, will everybody, we could also do it right before Thursday, um, before we have our next meeting for um, the strategic plan. Because you four will all be there, correct? No, Thursday is the 19th. The Thursday the 19th, and then it would give you time. Uh, is that too? Why don't we keep Tuesday? Just to play it safe. Next Tuesday, a week from today. Okay. You, that's not five days for a public hearing. The public hearing would be the following Tuesday. Right, that's true. Okay. 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 We got it? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, just so we're all on the same page again, um, next Tuesday at 7 o'clock, uh, we will post the meeting. Uh, we will meet for the purpose of adopting or not adopting the basic exemption, I will recommend that we do adopt it. Um, at that same meeting, we will talk about the posting of the public hearing on the 24th for the expanded exemption, which is also the, i.e. town version of it. Uh, and then we'll have the public hearing on the 24th through our regular meeting, and we will either approve or not approve um, the expanded one on the 24th. We got all that? Does that make sense? Okay. Everybody out there, follow? <laughs> oh, yeah, they're all open. Well, there's, a, there's the legal language of the resolution that we don't have. So it's an actual legal resolution of language that we haven't seen yet, because the original plan wasn't necessarily to approve it. I thought you could approve it and then determine at what level you're going to. Well, that's what the plan will be. But we haven't seen, we don't have the actual legal language of the resolution. So it's written in legalese language. It's not as simple as let's approve the basic. You know, it has to follow because it's a change in the property tax laws. So it's got to follow a legal procedure. What I would suggest, <laughs> don't get nervous. My guess, and I will speak for myself, uh, next Tuesday at 7 o'clock, I'm going to vote yes for the basic exemption. Um, so I think that's a done deal for the most part. But you're all welcome to come next Tuesday at 7 o'clock, as always. Hi, my name is Steve Miranda. I'm past commander of EFW and a long-time resident here. I grew up here, went to school here. Uh, are you planning on giving us the, uh, the ma maximum uh, exemption in the meeting on the 24th? Is that what the plan is? Is that the way I understand it? Or are you going to hold it to the basic one for this school year and then possibly improve it for the next school year? That's up for discussion. I think what Evan was asking for is just getting public feedback on raising the level. It does change the level a little bit. Um, you know, does it change it enough where, you know, it's something that maybe should be phased versus going from nothing to maximum? You know, that's a conversation. Any other questions or comments? 
Okay. I thank you. Um, we'll close the public hearing portion of this. Um, thank you all for coming. And as we said before, thank you again for everything that you have done to the community and for your country. We appreciate it. Let's move on to the next piece of our special presentation, which is the budget. Um, and I guess you're our master of ceremony. standing in the few people that are here in front of the few people that are here. And I want to be able to see the screen anyway. Okay. <laughs> Excuse me? You have to update yourself on all the military forms for the next public <laughs> hearing. Just before you start, yes. I was having a problem logging into board docs. Is anybody else having a problem? Are you on the wrong Wi-Fi? I'm on. High school Wi-Fi. Now it's asking for a password. It never did before. Are you on the high school Wi-Fi? Yeah. So you're welcome to use mine, Jim. I have a hard copy. OK. Oh, wow, 10 minutes in show. But um. OK, sorry. You know, I, I can't not address this. You know that it, I had to. <laughs> you, yes, I your way, you knew. <laughs> you knew that I had to address this. Okay. I had the information on all of those different levels of exemption, but the information was complicated enough in my simplified version of it. And what came across was I th what I thought the information that the board needed to make a decision, the impact, um, you know, whether or not there were, uh, I detailed the levels of disabled veterans that may have had a slight difference. Um, I did get all the information from the assessor. I focused on Phillipstown because that's 95% of our assessment, um, I felt that if I was bringing in different other different townships and different levels of disabled veterans, that it might cloud what the real information from you know the real information you needed to make a decision. So I don't want you to think that what I gave you was junk. Um, Okay. Yeah. So, so I, <laughs> I thought it was pretty accurate. <laughs> I mean, it was so you know, but I have to I have to say it because <laughs> it's who I am. <laughs> All right. So as far as our um, budget development um, goes, it's a new approach this year. And this is based on the board's parameters that um, we spoke about over the last couple of months. Um, that instead of starting with the rollover budget, talking about a wish list that might not happen and dwelling on items that we wish we had or what we're going to cut, um, the board wanted to know what's in the budget. So um, this is our, our new information to you we're going to present our budget by what's in it and what do you get for for your tax dollars um, our february meetings will describe what's in the budget this is the educational rationale part one it's the operations and maintenance and all other support segments february 24th is going to be the instructional programs um, which will be i think very informative um, not that this one won't, but this one is pretty basic. Um, our agenda is that we'll share what limited information I have on the governor's executive proposal, talk about the tax levy limit, the two components of the budget um, that are support components, the administrative and the capital, 
pupil transportation, uh, tentative vehicle proposition, and discussion. And Michael will will be helping helping me with the capital and the transportation part of it a little bit into the into the presentation. On January 21st, Governor Cuomo released his executive budget during his State of the State address. Um, the proposal includes an increase in school aid of 4.8% over last year's levels. That is contingent upon the legislature adopting the governor's education reform agenda, which um, has many things on it, but includes some major items um, such as new teacher evaluations and a permanent property tax cap. Um, if the legislator does not come to an agreement on these proposals, um, the state budget would include a 1.7% increase in additional state aid to school districts. And I just want to point out that that's a total statewide increase. That doesn't mean that Haldane would get 1.7% increase. Um, we know that it's always been a lot less because aid is allocated based on wealth ratios and the poorer districts get the bigger share of that 1.7% increase. That's an overall increase in the, in the entire state budget. Um, also, we're kind of budgeting a bit in the dark because the um, Division of Budget has also indicated that they're not going to release our state aid runs um, until April 1st, until we have final numbers. So, um, the recommendation is that we just budget at a 0% increase as far as our state aid goes. That we'll be lucky to get what we had last year. So and just on yep. that scenario, if the state doesn't agree to a budget by April 1st, the way it used to be, and let's say it runs till the end of May, you may not know anything about your state aid runs before the public vote? That's right. That's right. Okay. Yes, unfortunately. Um, another challenge to this part is our tax levy limit. Um, if you recall last board meeting, um, I had given you an estimate on our tax levy increase. Um, it's still the same this, this week because since I don't have those state runs, I could not finalize what our maximum allowable tax levy will be. So um, based on last year's information and what I know for next year, um, we're looking at a 2.35% increase in the tax levy that requires a simple majority. That's not going over the cap, if you will. Um, that's an increase in dollars of $423,045. Um, I just want to point out that our rollover budget increase um, we were happy with the the small percentage that it was 1.89 percent was 424.032, and I think we're at a good starting point because if you remember, that's before any retirements are taken out or any other changes um, put into place. Um, so I just want to put that up there for a moment um, to let you know that. Because of the new way that we're presenting the information, um, the slides have a lot of words on them. I won't be reading the PowerPoint slides word for word um, because I don't want everybody slumped over their their seats uh, by the end. So we have a three-minute warning. Okay, I, we're gonna have to like stop soon then because I won't. I don't think I'll be done in three minutes. <laughs> um, but I will point out some some highlights on each slide this will be posted it's actually already on board docs so you can go and read all the details of what's in the budget um, but I'm not going to read to you okay so our budget our final budget when it's distributed to the public is made up of three components. Tonight, as I pointed out, we're going to talk about the administrative and the capital. We'll talk about the program component um, at the next meeting. 
The administrative component, component is um, costs associated with our administrators, their clerical staff, school board costs, tax collections, legal, auditing, um, BOCES, and central data processing. I don't know why that's happening. It's my new technology here. Okay. Um, when you look at the budget in the form that I think we're all familiar with is the line by line budget. The expenses are broken out into different sections. Those sections are called functions. So I've organized this presentation into the different functions and we can talk about it. If you have questions while I'm going through each function, um, by all means stop me. Um, but um, that's the way that I've organized it, just because I needed some type of structure. The um, Board of Education section, obviously, are all of the, um, you know, the high pay that you get for, for being a board member is in this section, zero. And um, any memberships, uh, the district clerk, the, any supplies um, that she would need, legal notices that the district clerk posts, and the district meeting, which is the May vote, um, it includes the cost for the poll workers and the voting machines. Um, the, the next section is the office of the superintendent. This uh, includes the secretary to the stu superintendent and any related expenditures um, to run the superintendent's office. Finance, there's a few sections. Uh, the first is the business office. That's all the staff that's in the business office, the district's accounting, payroll, and attendance software, uh, BOCI services. Um, we have memberships in what's called Quest R3. We get the, the latest updates um, on what's going on in the state. A lot of times, a lot of the information that comes from the state is, is um, needs to be distilled down for us and they tell us you know, exactly what we should focus on. Um, I, I think I already mentioned the finance manager is our software, um, that our support comes from there. Also in under finance is um, the auditing fees. We have three levels of auditing. We have the internal claims auditor. Um, every payment that is made by the district needs um, to be checked for proper authorization and accuracy. Our independent external auditor is um, who will uh, certify and give an opinion on our financial statements for the year end and our internal auditor that helps the board um, make sure that our risks are identified and that we have good internal controls in place. Um, as Starting with the 13-14 state budget, districts with less than 1,500 students, which Haldane is one of, um, may be exempt from the internal audit function, but instead of claiming that exemption, the board um, said that we can reduce the frequency, we can do a risk assessment every other year and have a focus um, on the alternative years and um, it's good too because then the um, the board can focus on things that that might not always just be financial related um, you know you can really just only look at our payroll procedures so many years in a row um, last year we did an IT audit and it proved to be very beneficial and informative and actually um, our auditor wanted to use it as a model for other districts because we were really um, one of the first to do to do that. So by maybe exempt, that's at the discretion of the board. Yes. Or is there some application waiver process? It's at the discretion of the board. It's at the discretion okay. of the board. Um, also in finance, um, we have uh, treasurer expenditures, tax collector expenditures, and fiscal agent fees, which is a firm that helps prepare our debt service offering and our annual disclosure filings. Um, let me just back up. I forgot to mention the tax collector that we have a lockbox through M&T, and it enables the taxpayers to go and pay their taxes during any um, banking hours 
at the teller windows. It um, it's more <coughs> secure and uh, and more timely uh, that the money is deposited directly into the bank, and we don't have to secure it um, off off the banking premises. We can uh, you can get online and see current tax information. Uh, taxlookup.net. Uh, Haldane is just one of many districts that are using that service. So, Anne, if I could just jump sure. in before we go back um, to the the discussion on the auditors, just so you know, um, it's at the discretion of the board, and it is one of the few things that um, has been approved as an unfunded mandate, reprieve from an unfunded mandate. So that was one of the, th the very few things that has uh, gone by the wayside if the board chooses to do so. Something they probably look forward to not getting rid of them. <laughs> well, there, because there are so many different auditors right. and different, it's something that's an option. Okay. The, the next function in the budget is called staff. Um, among other things, there are legal expenditures that we pay for under this, this function, our uh, district attorney that's on retainer, our bond council, which is uh, another company that specializes in debt service offerings, and also our district's council for negotiations are all included in this section of the budget. Um, we do not have a dedicated human resource department because we're, we're a small district and we're not fully staffed. Day-to-day -day tasks are handled by current staff, um, but we rely on BOCI services um, regarding recruitment, certification programs, and online processing of applications for open positions. Um, it's really a nice service that's centralized and um, we take advantage of that. Also under staff is records management uh, to manage district-wide records. Um, there is a whole, actually, handbook on records management for school districts that we have to comply with. Um, we were uh, very lucky last year when we had our issue at the district office that we were able to secure a couple of um, storage vessels to, to put these in. We still have some organization to do. That generally happens over the summer um, when we can get some extra help in to just pack up boxes and move them around and, and, um, and even uh, designate which records can be destroyed because there is a, a retention schedule that uh, we do also included in that section of the budget is the uh, expenditure to have a, a truck actually come and shred the items for us because of the volume. Um, public information, we uh, do have an in-house web page and four newsletters that are distributed throughout the school year. And um, we have been having some conversations to consider the feasibility of absorbing the public information functions into an internal position in the district, maybe in 1516. Central services, our special items, our central printing, and um, other special items include our insurance coverage for the entire district for general liability, property, auto, the school buses, uh, legal liability, and student accident. Those are all um, under the special items part of the budget. And uh, BOCES assessments. We have administrative and capital construction costs that are associated with our membership with BOCES that are assessed on us annually. Instructional administration. Um, this is the costs of running the schools, the administrator's salaries, their clerical staff, and the cost to run those offices. Um, it, it includes things as contractual items and equipment that's used in the, in the offices. Uh, professional development provides funding for programs, workshops, and staff development, um, both through BOCES and through other sources. A uh, big part of the budget is employee benefits. Now, even though the um, 
employee benefits are allocated to all three components. I'm not going to repeat the same information for all three. So these employee benefits are related to the component of the budget that they belong to. Administrators and the superintendent and the business office would be allocated to the administrative component, operations and maintenance to the capital, and any instructional staff, their employee benefits would be allocated to that section of the budget. But just in general, I'll describe the employee benefits. Um, it covers the cost of the retirement systems, social security, workers' comp, health insurance, unemployment, and union welfare benefits. As far as our retirement system benefits goes, we have two. Our New York State Employee Retirement System. Those rates are set by the state, and next year our average contribution will decrease from 20.1 of salaries to 18.2. Now again, here is another case where I've simplified the percentages. We, there we're up to tier six now, and each tier has a different percentage and different rules as far as how much of their, of their salary is is to be uh, multiplied by this. This 20.1 into 18.2 is the average of all of those tiers. This is basically what it's going to cost. The Will the final bill be this exact percentage? No, but you get the, the gist, of, <laughs> right? Um, the teacher's retirement system also are rates set by the state and must be paid for certified personnel. Um, last year, the board took advantage of the pension smoothing plan um, that avoided an additional $301,000 in budget cuts for this current year for 1415. And um, rates for TRS have come down dramatically. Um, we're hoping that shows a, a future trend, and it, it's not just a one year. Um, strange thing that happened um, but we have until June of 2016 to decide whether or not to opt out of this or not going forward and um, I do have a lot of information to share with the board it's too much that we would want to talk about tonight but to just so that you can make an informed decision on whether or not to opt out and when Okay, I know that it's the, the board's intention, and even it was mine last year when we were talking about it, to not stay in it for the whole eight years. Um, but different information um, has been shared now that the rates have come down so drastically. Um, when would be the right time to get out of it? Not if, but when. And um, we'll have those conversations later in the year. Other employee benefits that are really straight uh, percentages by both federal and state are Social Security, um, which is FICA and Medicare, workers' comp, and unemployment benefits. Um, unemployment benefits must be provided for all eligible employees. Um, the district participates in the Putnam Northern Westchester Health Consortium. The health insurance rates are anticipated to increase one and a half percent for 1516. They've really um, been very reasonable as far as um, market percentages go to, to be in this consortium. Um, and our staff contributes varying amounts to their health insurance premiums based on their contracts and years of service. Um, the district also pays for dental and vision coverage based on unit contracts, whether or not the, uh, um, the employees are covered under the CSEA dental vision plan, or if um, the money is given to the, um, the trust fund for teachers and administrated, administrated by the, um, the faculty, sorry. Last on the employee, employee benefits, so the district participates in the Employee Assistance Program, which is a confidential counseling service for employees and their families. Um, we make non-elective contributions to employees' tax shelter annuity accounts for sick day sellback. These are also contractual items. 
And there's a budget allocation for shared savings, which is um, when an employee opts out of the health insurance coverage, um, they, they do uh, enjoy a save, some type of payment to share in those savings. Um, again, all of, of, well, those last items, not the employee assistance program, that's uh, not something that is in a contract. That's offered to every, every um, staff member. But the other items are all contractual items, either through the HFA, um, the HAA, or CSEA. So at this point, we are going to um, switch over to the capital component, and Michael is going to uh, help me with that. He's going to talk about operations and maintenance, and um, then I'll jump in and talk a little bit about debt service and interfund transfers. Thank you, Ann. Good evening. I'm Mike Twarty, Director of Facilities. And um, I'm here to talk about operations and transportation. Click. Okay. I'm going to talk about the capital component of operations and maintenance. This part of the budget includes the salaries for director facilities where you get the most bang for your buck. Um, <laughs> I have six cleaners, two maintenance workers, one maintenance mechanic, one five cleaner drivers, and one maintenance helper. Building space that is to be man maintained and cleaned is approximately 135,000 square feet, and we have approximately 14 acres of grounds that we maintain. In addition to the 14 acres of grounds that we maintain, we have a partnership with um, St. Basil where we play soccer games, and our part of the partnership is we maintain the fields, line the fields, cut the grass, and it helps St. Basil out, and they help us out. We have further uh, partnership with uh, the village where we use Mayor's Park baseball field. Um, last year, we helped bring that field back up into shape by bringing clay there. They wouldn't have been able to use it for baseball last year. So from now on, I'm um, setting aside a little bit of money every year to keep putting clay there so we don't run into the hardships with that field that we've had in the past. But these uh, partnerships that we have with the village and St. Basil's and helps us out a lot with our, with our own budget. Um, even now we're working with the highway department. We had planned on that big snowstorm, the village was actually gonna bring their equipment in here to help us make a pass through there because there's no way with the equipment we have we would have been able to do a two or three foot <laughs> snowstorm. So they did make a pass through and that's something to consider in the future with them also. Um, I'd like to compliment my guys, as a matter of fact, all my staff on the way they've been handling the snowstorms. Uh, they've been doing a great job. And going into that, something else that gives us uh, a, a little more help, what we started doing uh, last year is we got some automatic floor scrubbing machines also, part of the equipment budget. And what that's been doing is Today's a perfect example. If you walk into the school in the morning after all the kids come in, there's salt, everything all over the place. Well, when it's wet, we can right away in the morning go over with these automatic floor scrubbing machines, take the salt off and the liquid that prevents people from uh, slipping. We're getting the salt off and the water, and then the floors look good again, and it's also not hurting the wax and everything else that we have on there. So it's a, a twofold benefit there. Now we're going to go on to uh, some health and safety issues that we've run over in the last year. Uh, first one was the modular classroom demolition. Uh, as everybody I think knows at this time, uh, during the early part of the summer, the, the beginning of the summer, we found some water damage in there. And uh, we had a bunch of experts in, engineers and everything, and health and safety people from BOCES and determined that the cost of fixing the the modulars was not, we would not get the bang for our buck out of that. So we did demolish them. And uh, now we have a nice grass area there, open space, and it looks nice. Asbestos abatement. Uh, we hit two areas this year. Uh, every six months we have what we call our, our triennial inspections. Within a three-year period, there's a six-month 
survey that they do. They come in and they uh, check our buildings to see if there's been any changes. Uh, in the audit, in the gym, gymnasium auditorium there, there were some changes on the walls. Uh, those walls are, do contain asbestos, and some of them were starting to crack and uh, get a little loose. Some of the plaster was starting to get a little loose. So um, our, our environmental company explained that we better start considering abating or fixing some of those areas because if any of that stuff came down, we might have some problems. So uh, we worked in that area, and they, uh, re they took out uh, the bad areas that were cracked, and they put all new uh, plaster on top, painted everything. Most of the areas were behind the ba uh, backboards on the north side and the south side of the auditorium, and also on the, uh, the walls closer to the stage there. So they did a good job. If you walked in there now, you won't see any of the cracking or peeling. And um, also during this process, we were concerned about what might happen in the future in there. So uh, I had my home maintenance staff now certified in a asbestos uh, on, an O and M license, which means they can uh, now abate themselves up to 10 square feet or 30 linear feet of asbestos. Um, so this way, if we see anything happening in that room again, right away, uh, our own maintenance staff can jump on it. On the, we have a crosswalk, which is uh, down from by the circle, by the main building, that comes up along the elementary playground, going up to Mabel Merritt in the district office. In the past, cars during the day have been going up and down that. Uh, children, delivery people. Uh, it's pretty dangerous because that's a high volume walking area between the district office and, and also some of the high school kids. Um, we decided at the beginning of the school year that our staff, Michael Lizacatis, uh, made these gates. They, they swing open and close. They're not locked because if we need them to open real quick for the fire department, we can't just push them open. But it has stopped vehicular traffic there, and things are a lot safer now. And it, you get a chance to look at them sometimes. It's really a top-notch professional job that they did on that, and that's all done in staff. Another thing we already started off in the high school with the environmental uh, groups up there. Uh, we put in two of those uh, water filling stations, water bottle water filling stations. It filters all the water and it saves people from keep getting more plastic bottles. You have your own container you can fill. It does filter and clean the water and it also shows how many plastic bottles we're saving on there. We thought it was a big success at the high school and then all of a sudden the middle school children started saying, hmm, our water doesn't taste so great, why don't we try this? So we got two more for this building, and they have been a success also, and I'm going to increase. I'm going to put another two in, I think, by the end of the year. The DO structural repair. Uh, before, the, right around the beginning of the summer, uh, I'm sorry, the, the end of the spring there, beginning of the summer, uh, we started noticing some problems up in the attic, second floor of the district office, and... Um, we had some engineers in and discovered there was uh, some structural problems there with one of the beams that it was cracked. So at that point, uh, they recommended that we uh, stabilize those beams, and we did have a company come in, stabilize it. After they stabilized it, the engineers came in and gave us a clean bill of health in there. And we now uh, also moved a lot of our storage from there. As you can see, the storage containers on there and uh, so nice and organized in there now. And now we can feel a lot more safe and comfortable in the district office. We also started a program this year with tree pruning and removal. Um, earlier in the year, we had three different companies come in and look at problem areas on the campus. We walked the whole campus with them because it seems over the last couple of years, people from the community have been calling up and suggesting that we remove their trees or remove trees that are on our property that they feel threatened by. So the right way to go about it was to have these professional companies come in 
and rate the trees from one to five on what was dangerous, five being the most dangerous. And uh, so I compared all three reports and their prices, and what we did is the trees that were fours and fives and a couple of them that were threes that we thought were dangerous, we have had already taken down. Um, some of it was pruning, some trees were taken down. To save costs with removing all the trees from our property, our wood burning uh, maintenance people and cleaners took some of the wood off it. That saved us literally probably $25,000 right there alone just in tree removal. Uh, this program is gonna continue, uh, you know, at least once a year we'll have a, a company come in and assess some of these trees and see if there's any further damage or anything that necessitates taking some more limbs down or some more trees. Aldane's five-year plan. SED requires that each district have a building condition survey performed every five years and a five-year capital facilities plan developed. The goal of the plan is to collect, coordinate, analyze, and prioritize facility infrastructure and building program needs on a district-wide basis. We are due to have our BCS performed this summer and our plan filed with SED this fall. We've already started looking uh, and talking to some people and we're getting ready to send out an RFP for this. Uh, and then the board can make a decision. Our Buildings and Grounds Committee. Our recently revived Buildings and Grounds Committee will meet regularly, monthly, to reflect on work completed as well as reprioritize future work as needed on a needed basis on changing condition and infrastructure needs. Now, um, we have already scheduled this meeting for February 25th. Uh, I've also started with my maintenance crew because they're the guys that are generally, you know, looking at the buildings day in, day out for what's going wrong. Uh, I've sat down with them and we have a list of at least 30 things already and we've rated them and, and prioritized them for sa safety also. Uh, I will be bringing this to the Buildings and Grounds Committee. And, um, okay, yep, go on. Operations and maintenance, what projects are next? Maintenance and repairs are included and addressed annually through the district's comprehensive maintenance plan and included in the O&M budget. One large maintenance project under consideration for this year and for this coming summer will be the gym floor. Uh, since I've come here, I've looked at the gym floor and, uh, you know, at different times you can see part of the floor, like when you first go in, it rises and it's a little bit buckled at times. Also over by uh, the closet on the western side of the, right behind that basket, that floor, there's some, a little bit of spacing behind some of the, between some of the boards, which isn't good. And there's a little rise in some of those areas by that door, which we had to uh, address last year. Um, so that's what I'm looking at now. That floor, you know, before it degrades any further and becomes a bigger job, I'd like to do it. But I want to stress that we're not going to do that at the expense of something that is, you know, as far as health and safety is, is more important. Okay. Next two pages are for Ann. Sure. I'll just talk from here about um, debt service that um, our debt service is part of the capital component because the debt was incurred for capital items, buildings, renovations, and vehicles. That's why, you know, you wonder why is it here and maybe not an administrative. It's in the capital component because it's so closely related. And this part of the budget is where we repay our debt, our principal and interest on bonds and bans. Um, and, and debt is good. We don't want to be debt free. It's it really is uh, strategic, and and I we even talked about it during our strategic planning committee um, when we were there. That um, the consultant also agreed. You know, maybe in your house you want to be debt free, but in the school district it's good um, to have debt. It means that we're doing projects. Um, we're well with under our debt limit, and. Um, it also helps with our tax levy limit. It, it is an exclusion from there. Um, it, it's not going to affect um, our tax levy limit. 
um, interfund transfers are transfers to other district funds. Um, if you remember, the repair reserve was established last year um, by the voters. Uh, this is uh, our intent is to take the amounts received for the athletic field use to offset the cost of the future turf replacement. Um, there's an interfund transfer annually to the special aid fund for the general fund share of summer special ed programs. Um, it's uh, by state law, the general fund must pay 20% of the expenditures. And um, also our annual um, support to the cafeteria fund is in this section of the budget. Back to Michael. Okay, back to me. Now we're on pupil transportation. Um, the district currently transports over 440 students daily to and from Haldane Central School District and private and parochial schools covering approximately 285,000 miles annually. This miles is in addition to mileage for sports, extracurricular, or class trips. There are 18 regular runs each morning and afternoon. The district owns eight buses, six vans, six minivans, and one car. All of the minivans and cars and most of the full buses are used daily for student transport, and the rest are available for athletics and field trips and emergencies. Uh, we have, out of the five, eight buses, five of those are on our regular blue, green, yellow, red, black bus every day that we use for the regular student transport. Now that leaves us with three big buses, and that's bus 59, bus 66, and bus 70 that are used for emergencies, number one, like if one of our other buses has to go in for DOT inspection or needs a repair, sports trips, and, um, and also class trips. Now out of those three, Bus 59, we're lucky we got as far as we have with that. That bus is very old. Um, I'm not anticipating that passing any more DOT inspections after this. Uh, bus 66, we should be okay for another year. And bus 70 is okay. So after bus 59 goes, we're going to have two backup buses, and that, not just backup, that's also inclusive of using it for sports trips. Um, the district staff employs a total of 28 transportation staff members, including a dispatcher, a mechanic, two full-time drivers and 10 part-time drivers, five full-time cleaner drivers, and one monitor. Three district maintenance employees also drive when a driver is absent. So a lot of times instead of uh, calling in somebody else or somebody doing overtime, the people that are already here on staff, my maintenance people that are driver uh, maintenance people, they'll go out and drive, and that saves us some money. The three district maintenance employees also drive, I said that. 50% of the salary for the director of facilities and transportation and 15% of the business managers and payroll clerk salaries are allocated to transportation. This helps maximize transportation aid. I just want to stress that each and every one of our buses is being used every day. Okay. Tenant of vehicle proposition. Um, we're looking for one big bus. As I said, bus 59 is not going to pass any more DLT inspections. Uh, right now, out of our vans, minivans, and our car, we do not have any extra vehicles. Uh, what happens now if one of them goes down, I have to use one big bus for a day for that. We don't have any extra vehicles. Uh, so we're going to be asking for uh, one bus or a minivan. Also, as far as uh, we need a maintenance vehicle, right now the one that is uh, getting a little old, we have a white truck that had replaced uh, it was like a, the blue truck that we had years ago. It's getting a little old. The floors are starting to rot out. And uh, if that goes down during one of these snowstorms, we're left with one truck to plow this place. And two trucks wasn't enough yesterday. Um, so that's something um, 
we're going to look into this year. And we, we will still hopefully have that white truck for another year or two. We will still use it until it totally dies out. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Ann. Um, just while you're on, well, you were on uh, transportation. Um, at one point, we had a chart that listed all our vehicles when they were put in service, condition, and when we anticipate them coming out of service. Mm -hmm. It was a chart. Yes, we. That was um, when we had it was an ad hoc transportation um, committee, and we looked at things like routes and condensing the, the right. different bus routes. And at that time, we had a replacement schedule for our buses um, because it was um, a, a nice idea at the time was to perhaps be on a replacement schedule, and we could trade in our vehicles when they had some value to them. That way you know, we wouldn't be spending the, the full tilt and then getting $2,000 because all that they're worth is scrap. That's where we are right now because several years ago when budget cuts were occurring, that was low-hanging fruit. So the, um, the bus proposition or the bus uh, replacement line item got cut out of the budget. Um, once something, especially from that magnitude, gets cut from the budget, it really doesn't make it back in. Um, so there were a couple years that we did not have any vehicle replacements. Um, so we're back in that, in that vulnerable spot now where we're replacing buses as they fail. Um, that's really all that we can do right now. Buses are very expensive. A big bus is $110,000. And although we, we finance it with a five-year ban, um, it, it's still costly. So we still have to be fiscally responsible as far as that goes. So Michael and I all the time look at this, our bus schedule, see when the next inspection is going to be, is there a possibility it might not pass, um, what are our bus busing needs for next year. We'll know that in April. If a, another run comes up and we don't have a, a, a vehicle to put on that run. Um, We've also, Michael has scheduled several um, meetings that we've had with some bus vendors about getting on a replacement schedule, not to have contract transportation and buy buses or, or contract out of um, the district, still own the buses, maybe lease them, maybe being on a, a better replacement plan. We've been investigating that. Um, there are certain years, though, where on that plan, I was uncomfortable with it because two or three big buses in one year drop off during the same year so we really need to look at that because that's a huge expenditure even if we're financing it over over three years but um we still have that schedule we still refer to it um it's not where we'd like it to be as far as having the luxury of trading in a vehicle when it still had life left in it and somebody else might be interested in it now we're just like with our the pickup truck we're using it until its last ride is the recycle. <laughs> okay. So can we just get a copy of that chart and maybe Absolutely. just a little footnote as to where the deviation went and what the thinking is? That would be helpful. Sure. And that's something that the public always seems to ask me, you know, what are you doing with all these buses and what are you doing with all these cars? <laughs> Obviously, it's a little more complicated than a simple yes or no, but that would be helpful. Questions from the board for Ann? Feedback on the new format? Hey, uh, Mike, you and your staff have just done a phenomenal job this year. Thank you very much. I know that there's been some big jobs just landed out of the blue, uh, but your staff just under your leadership stepped up to the plate and just did what had to be done, and uh, you know the school looks looked great. Thank you very much. Uh, so I know that the, the, the last couple of weeks have been you know, incredibly challenging with the weather. Uh, so a big thanks also for <coughs> helping get through that. But how do you feel we are? Are we equipped 
to deal with this kind of a winter. I think we've last we, we've got off easy well, the last few years. Well, some well, not last year we didn't. Uh, yeah. What I had last year we needed some help from uh, Nikki Lizakatis with uh, the big equipment to push back snowbanks. And I don't know if you were on campus today. We actually pushed some snow back today. Had Nikki come in. Are we equipped for these bigger storms like that? Absolutely not. But again. Some ways to try to get around that is, number one, trying to partner with the village. Like yeah. when we were supposed to have that big two, three-foot snowstorm, I went over with my hat in my hand to uh, Ed down there at the hockey department. I said, can you p please do me a favor? Can you make one or two passes through? And he said, sure, no problem. And uh, we didn't get the big storm, but he still made the pass through that day. I wish he saved it for yesterday. Yeah. But uh, so, I mean, things like that, uh, paying out, uh, two, $3,000 like last year or extra to those two companies coming in and pushing the snow back we had to do. I thought of uh, leasing like uh, a front loader, front end loader, uh, and I called up Pine Bush Equipment last year. But the problem was we had to have a minimum of four months lease, and I think it was almost $4,000 a month. So I figured at that $16,000 it was best – spent like with the Nikki Lizakatis or Harold Lyons to come in and help us out. If I had a perfect world, I'd love to buy one of those machines. Uh, we don't live there. No, we don't. <laughs> That's correct. Uh, if I could possibly, yeah. you know, if, if it was ever possible for me to get a good used one or one on um, auction, I'd rather have that than a new truck. Uh, you know, if I can get one for $25,000 or so, I mean, it would save a lot of time and it would save a lot of overtime because we spent a lot of time here yesterday. And if we had one of those vehicles, we probably would have spent half the time. It was, so I know it was a little long winded explanation, but no, we're not totally stepping. We've made do with what we've had. And thanks to the village and good partners, uh, we've survived. Yeah. Uh, establishing those relationships is yes. obviously yes. the key to this. Uh, you know the give and take because we have a lot of resources here that right. uh, the, the the town and the village can can surely take advantage of, uh, and right. in return we get uh, the use of things like their equipment. Although I imagine everybody wants they say, oh, the town's got a lot of a lot of heavy equipment, right. but they got a lot of roads that they need to clear right. at the same time as we need to Absolutely. clear our campus. So well, we actually spoke, spoke this morning about potentially creating some kind of um, you know a reciprocity with the village. Yeah. So that, it, and maybe there's something that we can do to help them and, you know, just be good neighbors. Well, we are doing, uh, we've already started helping them. Like last year was a big one with the baseball field. Um, mm -hmm. We went in there, we really got a lot of clay in there. We did a lot of manpower in there with our Kubota and equipment. We used some of their equipment. The village helped out, and then we also had the public help out. Uh, Lizakatis Construction came in and they donated their machinery and manpower and time. So it was really a nice project where everybody was working together and I, I see that in the future for all of us too. It'll make it better for all of us. Good. Good. You guys? No, it's very informative. Yeah. Very informative. I like the Tell format. Me. I like the format. It tells a story. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the you know, the person that just kind of comes in once a year to kind of find out what the budget's like, um, it's a lot easier to follow than just line items of all kinds of things. So I think it's good. Um, just one question, um, two questions probably. The tax, uh, the maximum allowable tax levy number, 2.35 or the 423,045, is that a firm number or is that still subject to some more information that we need? I don't have that information yet. Um, we were told, um, you know, when we, the school business managers were kind of looking at each other saying, well, we have to file this information, but it's different than what the rules are. What do we do? They said, for now, use what you have. Um, they might give us bits and pieces of the state run that we need. It, it might change, but it won't change much okay, so because our debt service, that's an exclusion, and our capital, um, our, our building aid, 
is pretty steady right now because we don't have any new projects that we've filed for that we're going to start getting additional aid for. So those numbers are pretty steady. So um, if it's going to change, it's not going to change a lot. Okay, so then the 423-045 increase is something that we can kind of go Very with. close and... to the ballpark. I okay. can't say that it's not going to change um, a few dollars up or down, um, but it's in that ballpark. Okay, thanks. Okay, good. Uh, let's I, see. Have an, I have another question for um, the operations uh, side. <clears throat> so... Uh, <clears throat> Obviously, the cost of fuel has gone down considerably uh, this year. Uh, what, is, what does that mean in terms of uh, where, where we stand uh, in our budget for, for this year? Uh, what's, like, what's our total fuel, fuel usage if you, if you add the cost of heating both buildings and uh, on all, all of our transportation needs? We're still rebounding off the information from our energy performance contract. We're still analyzing that data. Um, obviously, with the, um, you know, you see in, if you pay for fuel in your own household or even in your car, I'm enjoying a, a lower gas bill these, t these days. Um, it will be in fund balance yeah. or used in another part of the budget. But, you know, we would be... Um, I think fiscally irresponsible to cut in that part of the budget because who knows oh, what it's going to be for yeah. next year, you know, yeah. and enjoying it now. Um, but uh, probably what we're saving in fuel, we're spending in salt, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, good. So this was part one of explaining where all the money goes and how it goes. Part two will be on the 24th of February. And that's yes. where we're going to hear from the administrators, I assume. Right. And that's going to be more of the instruction related. But similar format will kind of tell a story. Yes, if you liked the way that this is, then, of course, we can build, um, build the next presentation around program information in the same, same fashion. Great. And then we're also going to talk about, as part of the workshop topics, reserve funds and fund balances and how that all kind of works. Yes. Um, so that actually probably will be an important meeting for people who are interested in the budget. Okay. Great. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank Good. You. Well done. Thanks, Mike. Get some sleep. <laughs> okay, Dr. Bowers. Okay, well, a lot of what was actually on my superintendent's report has been discussed. Um, the first is the governor, governor's executive proposal, and Anne explained the difficulties we're going to be having this year um, and the fact that we are going into the budgeting um, season with, with very little information, and we're just going to have to make assumptions. So um, it's very frustrating. Um, there's been a lot of discussion statewide about pushing the governor um, to send us the, the, the information at this point, and it doesn't look like anything's happening at the, at, so we're, we're, we're waiting. Um, the Strategic Planning Committee, we had our first meeting of the full Strategic Planning Committee um, this past week, and it was a, a very positive meeting. Um, we started out with, we have four essential questions. One of the first, uh, the first of the four questions was asked talking about um, asking the committees, in which we have five of, to based on their vantage point, how do we continue to keep a very um, active and, and positive instructional and extracurricular activities, um, programs within the Haldane community, at this, and at the same time being fiscally prudent. So that was uh, the charge. And a lot of very interesting ideas came out of that. I can tell you that, that some new ideas that hadn't been discussed before were put on the table. So that will come um, later on as we develop our strategic plan. So I would like to thank everybody who was part of that and who came out and uh, gave us their great thinking. So we have four more meetings that are, will be planned, and we will be presenting the strategic plan again in May. If somebody wants to jump into that process, can they still jump in? It's not too late, I or? I don't see why not. Okay, good. We certainly have room for people to, to share their thinking. Good. 
Um, the, sec the next um, item I have is about the co coalition, the, com the communities that care coalition. Um, we have two meetings scheduled um, in the near future. On February the 25th, we will have the normal CTC meeting, um, the monthly meeting, and in, on March 11th, if parents would like to come in and um, learn a little bit about um, the CTC survey that was given to our students last year. Um, we welcome them. It'll be at 6 o'clock at the Butterfield Library, and uh, we will be presenting the data at that point. So please feel free to come and join us. The next um, is that at the, at the, the next workshop, as Joe just explained, was budget and the reserves. So if you have an interest in learning more about the instructional budget, please come and join us for that. The Butterfield Library will be here on March the 3rd to discuss the potential of putting um, uh, on our ballot a referendum to, for the district to collect additional taxes above and beyond what the Butterfield Library presently has collected through the town. Um, we will be talking, we will hear the presentation to the board on March the 3rd. Um, and then we'll be talking about some of the ripple effects that could potentially occur if um, the if it's at the referendum is actually put on our ballot in May, and we'll talk about some of the the potentials there. Um, one thing I don't have, but I would like to let you know, um, I don't have it on the, the list here. But um, tomorrow evening, I will be presenting with Brian Ulm to the Board of Education of the Garrison School District um, some of our, some of the initiatives that we've taken part in this year and um, giving the students of Garrison an idea of some of the positive events and um, opportunities that will, they will have if they choose Haldane um, for their place to go to high school. So that's it for tonight. And just to follow up on that Butterfield Library um, topic, um, just so you guys are aware, and I sent, I know, the board a uh, copy of the regulation, that uh, under Education Law Section 259, public libraries can um, ask school districts to include a proposition for funding on their um, ballot uh, in the May election. Uh, the school district can't say no to that. Uh, the only discretion that we can give is when the uh, vote is and where it can take place. So they're going to come on March 3rd. Uh, I believe Jillian Thorpe's come, the executive director, and I think uh, the library's attorneys come, and they're going to walk through what the law says you can, you can't do, how it works, why they're looking for it. So they'll do their whole presentation at that point. Um, and then basically, you know, really what it comes down to, I think, is clarity as to what it means for us. And two, um, how do we accommodate the request? Um, because we don't have any discretion as to whether it happens or not. So just wanted to clarify that. It's not something that, you know. But it's a separate proposition, just like the bus proposition. It yes. would be just like yes, a separate. Yeah. Yep. But it may have an impact on us. And right now our school attorney, Mike Lambert, is looking into a number of questions that we have regarding it. So we will have more information when, um, when that discussion occurs. Okay. What's the impact? What is the possible impact? Then? Well, I can tell you at this point, um, we're concerned with the potential um, on the rebates for the tax cap. And we're looking at the legalities about taxing jurisdictions and the way that the laws have been set up. If one jurisdiction um, goes over the tax cap limit, then um, they, the community will not receive their rebates. And we're also looking at how that will affect this year and into next year because we have to also show 1% decrease um, in our tax levy um, by, through shared services, and we have to show that we're taking a good step towards um, decreasing um, the funding that we pay solo and we share more services. So um, if we have one, one taxing entity that goes above that, it may affect it for two years. So we have a number of legal questions that we have to look at. And so even though the district will be doing the due diligence to try to stay within the tax cap or the tax levy increase, um, it may affect everybody in the community. So that's what we're looking at. 
we've asked them to address those points when they do their presentation on March 3rd, uh, which they're going to do anyway as part of their public outreach. But we asked them specifically to address all that stuff when they come, and they will. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bowers. Uh, committee minutes, wellness, January 5th. Any? We had a, a very um, well um, attended um, wellness committee, and we talked about a number of different things that were related to our students and the farm to table initiatives and, and the way that we can keep our kids healthy and happy. And um, we did have uh, what came out of that was we had a parent that came in and presented different ways of having students utilize their bodies to. Um, enhance memory and enhance their stamina within the classroom. Um, so there are many different facets of wellness that were considered at that point. So it was a, a very Great. enjoyable meeting. And then I saw in the minutes that the character edu the, the committee wants to present the character education plan to the board at a future meeting. Yeah. Um, do you want to maybe one of our meetings when we do agendas talk about maybe sure. putting something on the calendar? Sure. Okay, great. That would be great. Thanks. Um, anything from the board on the minutes or no questions? Okay. Uh, communication from the public on anything? Uh, David, I want uh, parent of three children in the district. And first off, let me say, Peter, John, Joe, Evan, thank you. Um, this is a thankless job, and nobody says thank you. And sitting here watching you guys go through this budget presentation, Thank you. Um, I'm here to speak about the governor's proposal because it's more than just holding the kids in the school district hostage for political gain. Because the political gain that really is a question here is what's going to happen to the future of schools and public education. And I think really what he's trying to do is take even more control away from what we do in Haldane and what we do in every single school district and every single school building across the state. And that's really what is, to me, so incredibly infuriating where I look at this and say he's not only holding us hostage by keeping the runs out so we can't plan our budget so we can't do our jobs and we can't comply with the law and figure out what we need to do next year for our schools for our programming for our sports for everything but then he's using that leverage to try and take away the control over what our kids are going to be doing in the classroom and who we're going to have in front of the classroom and to me that's insane that he's going to use this this power to dictate to say, these are the teachers you're going to be able to have, these are the teachers you're not going to be able to have. By changing the evaluation process he's, he's proposing, he's tripling down on the effect of st standardized testing. He's taking that evaluation process, which after two years, I don't think has told a single school administrator anything that they didn't know three years ago about the performance of their staff or what was going on, doubling down on that and not going to get any more production out of what's happening in the classroom. And at the same time, creating a sense of stress and fear and terror among your staff and among the kids that's really not about making education better for anybody. And so I'm here tonight to say we got to all reach out to Sandy Galef, to Sue Serino, to anybody and say this insanity's got to stop. As I was looking up their contact information and sending Sue Serino my first email, um, I'm just asking you guys, this is something that's really if this bullying is allowed to continue, it's never going to stop. And here you've got probably one of the most unpopular politicians in the state of New York who has managed to alienate everybody, continuing to try and push the envelope and push us around. And I think this is not a partisan issue. This is an issue for every public school to say we're not going to take it anymore. And I think it's a message that needs to go to the Senate, needs to go to the Assembly, because otherwise he's going to get it and he's going to push it or, and he's going to take away what control we have over the schools and i look at all the work and the energy that we put into these schools on a daily basis weekly basis year the volunteer work we do to see that lost it is just infuriating beyond belief and i think that it's time for us to step back and say these are our schools they're successful hands off and that's all i want to say so thank you Thank and you. thanks for your work. Thank you. Hey, David, are you, yeah, Peter. Uh, I know you're a Haldane parent. Do you have any professional affiliation that you'd like to disclose to us? Uh, <laughs> no. No. Is the this gets me into trouble. Is the PTA usually does a bunch of letter writing kind of campaigns, advocacy, which is always 
actually pretty, pretty effective in it's years been effective, past. But that's just about the gap funding, and I think the, a lot of the stuff that's going on now is on a, such a fast track, right. and especially the holding the runs back is such a, so devastating because you got nobody can make a decision. Right. You know, you can't figure out what are we what's a levy going to look like. We're not going to meet our timelines if he continues to play chicken with this. So, to me, that's a huge. That's that's really you sort of raise it to a new level of bullying in this process. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you want to change the tape? Any other questions? All right. Let's change the tape. Okay. Consent agenda. Uh, minutes. January twentieth. Motion. Motion. Second. Uh, questions. Comments. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Julia. <laughs> uh, consent agenda. Financial. Motion. Motion. Uh, discussion. Just Everything looks good. Thank you to Box Tops in Education for the five hundred seventy-seven dollars and twenty cents. I think the, is it the PTA that kind of coordinates that. And Great, a lot thank of you. Scissor cutting and yeah, that is. That's a lot of money for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, consent agenda personnel. Motion. Uh, discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, unfinished business, L1. Uh, Community That Cares Coalition, just real quick. Um, at the last coalition meeting, uh, and I just wanted to reiterate that this is a great group. Um, excellent attendance. We've got our, some of our elected officials there. Uh, Nancy Montgomery from the town. Uh, Barbara Scuchamara from the county. Um, a great representation across the community. And we had said that we would put this as an unfinished business item um, at every agenda just to give it some exposure and recognition and we'll touch base on something uh, each meeting. But they're doing a great job. It's a great conversation. It's not a Haldane issue. It's a community issue. Uh, and there's a lot of enthusiasm to really move this thing forward. And, um, I know uh, Dr. Bowers, Julia Sniffen, Brian Om, um, Brent are really doing a great job kind of keeping Haldane involved. And uh, it's a good group. So I just wanted to mention that we're going to keep that on there every single uh, board meeting. Uh, PBL workshops? Well, we continue to have um, some great success with the project based learning initiatives that are going on in the district. And at this point, um, we have one um, group of graduates that graduated from PBL 101. About 20 of our faculty members have gone through the entire training and are now um, initiating the project-based learning in their classroom. Um, I can tell you when I'm there, the excitement that we're seeing is just outstanding. Um, we have a second cohort of teachers that are now being trained. Um, we had the first of, two, the first of three days um, that was about two and a half weeks ago, um, the, the following day was supposed to be the second day and we were snowed out and then we rescheduled and we were snowed out. And so now we are scheduled, we're hoping that this work Friday the 13th is uh, the next day and that will be the second of the three days. Um, then that cohort will then work with um, their students in the classroom and then the third day um, will be a share of all the great projects that have occurred. Um, one of the nice things that we are going to be doing is the first cohort of teachers will be mentoring and working with the second cohort of teachers um, so who are actually um, becoming quite um, well versed in uh, PBL. And then we'll continue on this summer and offer a PBL 102. So we have um, close to 40 of our faculty members that are initiating these projects. So kudos to them. They're doing a wonderful job. Great. And this is a great initiative. Thank you for keeping it, keeping it moving forward. Uh, communication from the public on anything? No. Thank you. Uh, new business, CSCA recommendations. <clears throat> this, this is a recommended action. The recommended action is that the Board of Education approves the recommendations by the Committee on Special Education and Preschool Education preschool special education as indicated. Uh, motion? Motion. Uh, discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, N2, approval of the district calendar for next year. Yeah, motion. 
Motion? Yeah, you got it from me. Yeah. <laughs> I do the motions. You do the seconds. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, communication from the public again? Anything? I can't believe there's no public comment on the calendar next year. No? Uh, we've had a couple of meetings already on it, so they know. Okay, this is old news, kind of. Uh, anything new from the board that you want to no. throw on the agenda? No? Okay. Uh, motion to adjourn? Motion. <laughs> I'll second. Peter, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Enjoy your evening. Drive carefully.